Consider for a moment the story of a veteran who has returned home from a tour of duty in a combat zone. The physical toll of war has long since worn off, but the traumatic events they witnessed or in which they participated have left mental scars that can never fully disappear without the right treatment. They visit mental health therapists specializing in post-traumatic stress disorder, but feel like they aren't getting better. The anguish of reliving the experiences makes it difficult to perform the exercises their therapist has, has clearly recommended, and the therapist has no clear sign of whether or not their patient is being forthcoming in each and every visit. This is an imagined but common scenario for American veterans who come home by the thousands with high rates of mental illness. Today, we're joined by Rosa Ariaga, a senior research scientist in the School of Interactive Computing, whose new grant from the National Science Foundation aims to take this challenge head on. What are the challenges to effective care of patients facing PTSD or other chronic illnesses? Can usable computational tools be the key to improving the effectiveness and efficiency of treatment? Why is it important that we in the computing community continue to think about how our technologies work for people in the real world? I'm Ayana Howard, Chair of Georgia Tech School of Interactive Computing, and this is the Interaction Hour. Dr. Rosa Ariaga received her PhD in psychology from Harvard University. She joined the School of Interactive Computing in 2007. She is a developmental psychologist in IC, focusing on designing usable technologies for chronic care management. She also has a role as the Associate Chair of Graduate Affairs in IC. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So you work in this domain of human-computer interaction in the, in the sub-area of chronic care management. So what exactly is that, and, and what is it that you do in, in your research for this? Yes, so HCI, human-computer interaction, really focuses on building systems that are useful and usable. And in chronic care management, uh, we have individuals who um, have access to all of this media support and what we want to find is a way of matching what they're already doing to improving their care. So in improving care, and, and uh, we had mentioned chronic care management, um, what kind of care are you talking about? So um, in the past you know, 10 years, I've looked at different groups of patients. I've worked with uh, young children with asthma or type 1 diabetes. I've also worked with adults that have congenital heart disease. And um, in all of these uh, groups of people, I'm really interested in, in looking uh, for three things. I want to be able to, buy, to find systems where uh, I can get the patient to engage with their condition. We know, for example, that something like 50% of individuals won't even fill their prescription. So that's already a, a big problem. Or they don't even consider themselves sick. So if you don't think that you're sick, then you're not going to do anything about it. The other characteristic of chronic uh, illness is that people visit the doctor three or four times a year. However, we don't have any, any tools to understand what happened between visits, right? So we call this continuity of care. And then the third facet is you finally get to the doctor. You, he asks you how you are, and you say, fine. So how do we use... Uh, the information from um, the continuity of care tool to actually mediate communication between patient and provider. And ultimately, for me, over the years, I really have started to think that what we want to do is we want to make uh, patients better advocates for themselves or parents for their children. So you mentioned these three things. You said patient engagement, continuity of care, and mediating communication. So um, let's take the asthma case, since that works with, with kids. Um, explain and, and walk us through these three themes and, and that example. Right. So one of my favorite papers, if I don't say so myself, is one that was called The Text Message a Day Keeps a Pulmonologist Away. And so once again, you have these kids that have moderate to severe asthma. They go to the doctor three or four times a year. And the doctor, again, asks how they are. But, you know, maybe the parent is there, and so they, the kids don't feel like they should necessarily even answer. And so to improve this, we built a text messaging system that asked them about their symptoms in the last four weeks. Did you wake up at night wheezing and coughing? Asked them about their asthma knowledge. 
you know, um, asthma's all in your head, true or false. And then what we did was we took the responses and put all this information into a dashboard. So that was bridging that, uh, that gap between the three or four months. And then what would happen is that the doctor would be allowed to see all of the information that was collected. So we knew about the patient's symptoms. We knew about their knowledge gaps. And what we found was that over a three or four month period, if kids answered these text messages, they actually had improved lung function, so their asthma got better, and some of them also had improved psychological function. So here we have a true causal relationship just from you know kids answering text messages where we never asked them to take their meds. But clearly, this response was, you know, led to this change in behavior. So one of the things that um, I know uh, we're interested in is making sure that our computing tools are equitable. Um, did you see any differences in, say, uh, social economics in the groups or any other things that you found quite interesting? Well, I think that's another point about the kind of... Um, computer scientists and the kind of re research that I that I do. And for me, it's exactly that point, that we know that there are disparities between people that live in Buckhead and people that might live in the old Fourth Ward. And so are these tools getting to them? So we did run a second set of studies where we looked at kids that had public insurance. We had kids that had uh, private insurance. And as you know, these are mediators for uh, socioeconomic status for their parents' income, their parents' education. And we actually found that even less um, uh, uh, text messages helped them. So when these kids that had public insurance had even a single text message every other day, it improved their lung function, right? So once again, we have evidence that very simple computing can actually help alleviate some of these negative impacts of uh, chronic illness. And that's what really um, gets me excited. And so this is the power of computing. Exactly, and the power of robust computing. Um, you did a great interview with Gregory. He loves his future computing, but I'm like, look, there's people now that we can help. And that's what I uh, do in my research. So from asthma in youth to congenital heart disease in adults, your next focus is in an area where we unfortunately see a major need in our country right now. We're talking about veterans, and many return home from combat zones or other troubling situations facing new mental health challenges like depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And stats show that less than 50% in need actually receive the proper treatment. So let's talk first about what treatment looks like today. Right, and so one thing to kind of underscore is this is mental health treatment, but it still has those three, uh, those three values, right? We wanna engage patients. Do we know that they're actually doing what they you know, can do to improve um, their, their mental health status. We have continuity of care. You have a doctor that meets the, the patient, but there's no information in between those uh, patient visits. And then we have this communication gap. And here in the clinical situation, we have both, how do we improve the delivery of the therapy? So we're trying to help the clinician. And then we're also trying to give the patient feedback about um, their practice, so what they're trying to do. So we have a scenario where um, in the gold standard therapy called prolonged exposure, what, we, uh, what therapists want to do is get the patient to reimagine, in a sense, relive that traumatic event. So that's the narrative part. And this is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, therapist and patient situation. Okay, so you're talking about reliving the event. Um, so I, I can see that that could possibly help, but you're, you're saying that there's more, like computing can do more. Exactly. The idea here is, so currently, back to how we improve the efficacy of the therapy. Right now, there's um, very little sense of what a good imaginal narrative, right, uh, looks like. You know, what, to put it very simply, what percent of words should be first person? What kind of, what number of adjectives should you have? What does visual imagery actually mean? And so the idea is, you know, with our colleagues um, in Rochester, is that we can use natural language processing to try to characterize these optimal narratives, to try to characterize what are the questions that really good therapists ask. And so in that sense, to be able to give these tools to improve um, uh, therapy delivery in the long in the long run. So these are therapy exercises, um, and so you know I like to exercise, but you know not everyone is consistent in their exercise. So even if we create this interesting new narrative, 
how do you guarantee that the patient actually does it when they go home? Well, that's the point, and that's one of the things that we underscore. You know, in the last hundred years, uh, psychotherapy hasn't changed. You have this situation where you have um, a therapist, and of course, that's a, a kind of an art, and then you have the patient, and there's this huge reliance on self-report. And the issue there is that um, one of the you know, one of the things to underscore is that when you're having mental health issues, even your reporting might be off. You might feel like you're really engaged, but there's no way to understand what that is. So what we're trying to do in this new grant is we're trying to leverage all the robust sensors on the phone to try to give feedback to both the clinician and the um, veteran, right, to give them feedback about how the therapy went. Did the patient engage in the exercises. And so we talked about the narrative part, but there's also an in vivo component. So one of the things that happens during uh, the treatment is they work with a group therapist to come up with a set of um, steps. So a hierarchy of stressful events from least stressful to most stressful. And the idea is that when the patient goes home, they're going to listen to that imaginal narrative again. When they go home, they're going to go through the least stressful event. But again, how do we know what happened? And once again, if you think about the really, all of the sensors that are on your phone, we can understand if you were actually listening to your um, recording, you know, for the 25 minutes. We can understand if you were at um, the park you said you were going to be and or if you're at home, if you were actually watching TV while you were listening, because we can, you know, we can monitor that. So again, making sure that we're keeping the patient's privacy first and foremost, how do we leverage these robust sensors on your smartphone to actually bring better delivery and better practice of, um, of this gold standard, which is exposure therapy? So you mentioned the, this gold standard of exposure therapy was this imaginative narrative and this in vivo. And you mentioned this level of, I guess, realism. Yes. Can you give an example? If you so will? for example, um, and, and first of all, these are very, you know, stressful situations. And so just for your audience, you know, these things are obviously very difficult. So um, we have an example, and this is a persona, right? So it's not exactly something that happened, but something that tells us something general. So um, a person in Iraq, a veteran, um, has this traumatic event of having, in escaping from uh, being in hot pursuit, um, they happen to go into a school playground and they happen to run over um, a number of children. I mean, obviously, that's a terribly traumatic event. Now the person can't be around playgrounds, can't be around, you know, um, laughing or screaming children. And so the idea would be that maybe the lowest thing they can imagine themselves doing, again, so on this hierarchy, might be I can go to the park at 7 a.m. when there's not going to be any kids there, and I can stay there for 25 minutes. Well, now he would open his app and we would be able to um, give him the feedback about his stress level at the beginning of the session and at the end of the session. And so then you have this, this interactive therapy experience. Right. And back to the point that you made, when um, one of the things we know about these veterans is sometimes they don't even know that they're getting better. They don't feel that, that change. But now we can know and they can have the data that shows that, look, your subjective unit of distress has actually been decreasing over these three days. Um, we can look at galvanic skin response and say, look, you can actually see that from the first day of therapy to the third day of therapy, there's been a huge drop. And this um, objective data is also really important for them. You know, so this is interesting to me. And, and I would actually say this because I don't actually remember or recall that you, you studied post-traumatic stress disorder. So what is your background and, and how did you get into this area? So I guess, um, so you're right, my background is not in this. And, and I guess maybe this ties back to my role as associate chair and why I value this position. And the idea is that as, uh, you know, 
as an institution that values the training that we're providing for all of the next generation of scientists, we don't know the kinds of questions they're going to ask, right? So as you know, I was a developmental um, uh, cognitive neuroscientist, right? The work that I did was at the intersection of psychophysiology and epistemology. Yikes. Um, so how does that bring me now to where I am? And the idea is that I received the kind of training that allowed me to problem solve, that taught me how to be systematic in, um, in the way that I approach a problem, and that gave me a set of tools that I can now use with questions I never en envisioned that I would be asking. And um, that really is what good training um, does for an academician, and that's really what we do here at Georgia Tech. So you mentioned training, um, and so as a researcher, you're also the Associate Chair for Graduate Affairs at the School of Interactive Computing. So what do you exactly do that's related to this training that you just described? So I think that um, back to understanding that our role is not to have the next generation of mini-me's, right? We don't want a mini Ayana or a mini Gregory, but we want problem solving that takes advantage, of, takes advantage of the current technological, methodological, computational tools and teaches students how to apply the, these to all sorts of questions. And so um, a lot of what I do is there are milestones within all of our uh, doctoral and master's levels programs. And so what I make sure is that we're all on the same um, wavelength as to what it means for us to uh, be providing students the kind of training that's going to take them to the um, next level of preparation, whether that's going into academia or going into industry. So when you're asked by one of these students that might come to your office, you know, I don't really consider myself a computer scientist. Is, is this really the right program for me? What's your response? So, you know, computing has changed, right? Gregory has this great, Gregory Abel has this great article that talks about how originally computing was one to many. Um, that's the mainframe. And then we had kind of the one person and their PC. But now, right, we worked into the third generation where now you have, you know, one person and a lot of sensors. And so if you think about it, there really is data everywhere. And um, it's out there. And so what we want to know is how can we actually use it? And so computer scientists, all you know, variations of, a, of, um, of colleagues in this department, they work with all the data that's available. And so in that sense, we're all computer scientists. That's what makes us you know, the number one major at tech and also the number one minor. And not only that, but at all the top, uh, at the top tier universities in the country, computer science is really important. So in some sense, we have so much data and we need to know how do we manage it, how do we uh, work with it? How do we make it useful and usable? And that's the core of HCI. And so um, what I say is if you don't think that you're a traditional um, CS person or that you don't have the background, then interactive computing is definitely the right place for you. Okay, you've convinced me. I'm going to sign up. Great. So I have been truly fascinated on this conversation we've had about designing usable technologies for chronic care management from asthma to uh, addressing the needs of, of veterans. Um, I think that you have really laid the foundation of how we use computing for, for good for this target demographic. Um, we appreciate Rosa Ariaga for joining the Interaction Hour and encourage you to check out more coverage of this new grant from the National Science Foundation, as well as her past work online now at ic.gatech.edu. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at IC at GT. Thanks for listening. <laughs>